Welcome to episode 468 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing psychologist William Indick. He has written a number of interesting books for screenwriters about how to use psychology in your stories to build fully fleshed out characters, so stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our early bird deadline is March 31st, so if your script is ready, definitely submit now to save some money. We're looking for low-budget shorts and features. I'm defining low-budget as less than six figures, in other words, less than one million U.S. dollars. We've got lots of industry judges looking at scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. I had the winner from 2020, Richard Pierce on the podcast in episode 378. He won the contest. It was introduced to one of our industry judges, Ted Campbell, who was actually back this year and is judging again. And he took the the script to his contacts over at Mara Vista Entertainment and actually got the script produced. And we've had a number of other um, scripts optioned from the contest as well over the years. So we're getting a nice bit of traction with these scripts. I know there's lots of producers looking for high quality, low budget scripts. This year we have a short film category as well, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low budget short script by all means submit that as well once again I do have a number of industry judge producers who are looking specifically for short scripts if you want to submit to the contest just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest also again this year we're running an in-person film festival in tandem with the screenplay contest it's for low budget films produced for less than 1 million US dollars we have a features and shorts category The festival is going to take place in Los Angeles, California from October 6th to the 15th. If you've produced a short film or know someone who has, by all means, please do submit it or let them know about it. Shorts are easy to program. I can run two or three of them before a feature film or I can even do a whole section we actually did that last year at the festival we had a couple of blocks that were just like four um, short films Um, so short films are really easy to program it's fun to see them you get to meet a lot of filmmakers Um, so I really do encourage you um, not just to if you have a short but Think about even going out and just making a short. Write a short, go out and shoot it, and um, and see if we can screen it here at the festival. If you do have a finished film and would like to submit, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival. You'll see a link to our Film Freeway page. We're actually taking all the f- submissions for the film festival through Film Freeway, so you can find us on there as well. So once again, if you want to check out the screenplay contest, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And if you're listening to this podcast after the contest closes, We do run this contest every year, so just check back um, at our landing page and you can see whatever dates are approaching. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. And I know I give this message every single week. I say basically the same little bit about social media, um, but it really does does help spread word um, and that's why I just continue to sort of put this out there um, so if you have a minute do just go and just retweet it or, or share it on Facebook um, these 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 shares really do help spread that's that's how it works in this day and age um, you know people just share your information and that's how it goes further and reaches more people so again if you've already shared a bunch of my um, my podcasts and, and blog posts and stuff I really do appreciate it any websites or links that I mentioned the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode 468. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. Just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I'll teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline inquiry letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing psychologist William Indick. Here is the interview. Welcome, William, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Great to be here. So Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick overview of your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Sure. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, uh, not too far from New York City. But I've, I've always had a love for movies, uh, especially um, 
growing up, I used to watch old movies with my dad. So there was a connection there, but uh, also a sort of understanding of how movies evolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, I studied psychology in college and got a, a PhD in developmental psychology. So I've been a psychology professor for over 20 years, but my primary interest has always been in media and film and trying to use what I know about psychology to figure out not only the process of understanding film, but for screenwriters, the process of creating film. Mm -hmm. So over your career, I've noticed you've written, and we're going to talk about one or two books specifically, but you've written a bunch of psychological books that are sort of geared towards filmmakers. Um, how did you end up into that in that path? Um, is this just something part of your being a professor is publishing? Um, I'm just curious, like where, where, where do you see or sort of see this and how does this fit into your overall career as a professor? I would say when, when I started out uh, as a professor and a trying to teach a class like theories of personality, which involves a lot of very complex um, philosophies, like, you know, coming from Freud and Jung and Erickson. Uh, my students were having a difficult time understanding it, and I was having a difficult time explaining it. Uh, but I found that when I used examples from movies, they got it. They mm -hmm. have, movies provide, you know, behavior on screen that could be paused, around, analyzed. So it was very useful to use films in my class to teach psychology. And that, that was uh, what I started writing about. And then um, when I actually met Ken Lee from Michael Weiss Productions and uh, was talking about my book, he said, well, you should write something for screenwriters. Uh, and all you have to do is take these film analyses, these ways of trying to understand the psychology in film and just sort of flip it. Instead of making it an analysis, make it a prescription, say, you know, take this example from this film and mm -hmm. see how this director or this writer used this psych psychological principle in the behavior of their characters. And here's how you can do it in your script. So it was really just sort of a simple suggestion from somebody who uh, uh, gave me the idea to write not only for people interested in film, but people in make uh, who are interested in making films. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll dig into some of that. Um, but I wonder just to, as we start the conversation, can you give us some of those examples that you were just talking about? Like what were some examples of the concepts you were trying to teach the students that you were able to illustrate with films? Yes. I, so I think the first thing I did, the first film I used was American Beauty, which is a great movie, not my favorite movies, but it's so overtly psychological that it was a great way for me to uh, take the Freudian defense mechanisms and just sort of break them down and said, okay, well, here's this character from American Beauty uh, engaging in denial. And here's another one who's completely wrapped up in depression. And here's a sort of re the reaction formation at the end where uh, the, the character who hates all gay people obviously is gay himself. So j just taking all these little sort of psychological, well, you know, Freud called them defense mechanisms, mm -hmm. but in a film, if you put them, write them into your character, we can call them devices. Uh, and there were all those devices just sort of listed nicely in a row. And all I had to do was show the film and pause and say, you get it here, you get it there. Um, yeah, so so that, that was sort of the first time I used it, it worked quite well. And I just went on from there. Mm -hmm. Now, as you've gotten into this and started to analyze in that direction, um, have you seen some issues where screenwriters maybe could use this prescription where they maybe gloss over some of these things? Um, and, and again, taking that and sort of giving a prescription, like what are the mistakes that screenwriters make when not applying some of these psychological tenets? Well, I mean, the, the one principle of screenwriting that always should apply is show don't tell if you have if you can explain something about your character by something they do rather than having a voiceover narration tell the audience what they should think about that character then you know i i would think it's the screenwriter's duty or the director's duty to to to, to express it visually or through action or behavior mm -hmm. and um so, so when i see um a movie and i see they're not even trying to explain things through action and dialogue. It's just constant voiceover uh, so that every scene is just almost a narration of what's going on in the character's head instead of the, the audience trying to figure that out through their behavior and through their dialogue. Uh, that, that's where I think, you know, first of all, you know, the screenwriter should have read a book about screenwriting. And then secondly, they should have read a book about psychology for screenwriting because that's all about making um, those psychological traits of the characters 
visible but not obvious mm -hmm. uh not uh, uh no one's telling you what you should think about the character nevertheless the behavior of the character itself determines what the audience will think yeah so one of the things with any kind of prescription like this and you get the same sort of pushback um from these screenwriting books by sid field blake snyder one of the things that i think like using this example of a freudian like you know oedipus is sort of the prime example of obviously oedipus was written way before freud and then freud comes along and then they do sort of a reevaluation of oedipus through this freudian lens and i often think that you just mentioned american beauty and i can tell you from dealing with a lot of screenwriters a lot of the, the 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 films that are um you know really well done like american beauty are really good on the character generally i find it comes from a very intuitive place from the writer and and so i always feel like a lot of these things a lot of these sort of prescriptive things are sort of after the fact and it's i'm always i always wonder how that really helps like i don't know that a freudian analysis of oedipus really would help a writer much um and so i always wonder how can we actually shoehorn this in to help the writers because number two that's number one number two the people that are more analytical um you know it's the right brain left brain the people that are more analytical tend to be better on structure but those are the people i think in some ways you might appeal to this but i don't know that they're necessarily that good at this part of the equation um they might be more into structure and st story as opposed to the character um so that's what sort of what i get it but i wonder if you can speak to that a little bit how can screenwriters actually implement this um into their screenwriting in sort of a more practical way oftentimes when i'm uh, trying to explain things to my students i make things as simple as possible and then i and and then you know get to the complicated from there so that Basically, any principle in psychology is a fairly intuitive thing that we know about ourselves, yet we have to really study it to understand the mechanisms behind it. And that's what I think is true about film. Film is a, a, a very user-friendly medium. Anybody could watch a movie and anybody could understand a movie on any level. But the screenwriter has to understand the movie on a much deeper level. They not only have to intuitively get what these characters are about and how they're going to interact, but they really have to be very, very, um, uh, have a lot of finesse and a lot of skill in the way that their characters interact and the way that their uh, characters behave so that they can give you a sense of who they are in a way that's not obvious. And I think that's where things, intuition falls flat, where you can have a sense of who a character is and you can write that into that character through voiceover narration or through having them you know explain in some soliloquy how they feel but to be able to get to provide a, a caricature of this character to the audience that gives you that tells the audience what they need to know about this character without having to draw it out for them uh that's where I, I think a little bit more skill and a little bit more study comes into play and probably probably more useful than reading a book on the psychology of screenwriting would be watching a thousand movies mm -hmm. and, and and then and getting that sense uh, you know intuitively just from watching characters behave on screen. Uh, the benefit to a book like Psychology for Screeners, Screenwriters is I've watched a thousand movies. So I can sort of give screenwriters a little bit of a guide and say, well, go to this movie for a good example of denial or go to this movie for a good example of a Jungian archetype. So that when filmmakers are doing the primary job of becoming a filmmaker, which is watching a ton of movies and trying to understand them on a deeper level, they might have a book or two to guide them in that process. And it's not just oh, what's on TV tonight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I think that's um, that's an excellent answer. So I notice in your book you have um, three of your early chapters. One's on Freud, one's on Erickson, one's on Young. Um, I wonder if you can just quickly go through those three psychologists. I mean, I think we've all sort of heard of Freud and sort of understand what he's about, at least to some degree, in sort of just popular culture. But Erickson and Young, these are people we've all heard of. But I honestly don't know anything about them or how they even differ from Freud. But just give us a little snippet. It. Like, like, what are those chapters about? What are those psychologists about? And how can screenwriters maybe learn more about them or, or implement some of their ideas? 
Uh, yeah, and that's true. And when we speak of Freud, Freud is almost imp impossibly broad, broad. He wrote so many books on, on so many various topics. And what he was trying to do was create a theory of everything, uh, a way of explaining all psychological behavior and phenomenon with one theory. So it's very, very broad. So, so if you try to sort of buckle it down and say, well, what was Freud about? Probably you could say, well, it was about the unconscious. And that's as far as you can go without, you know, saying another 10,000 words. But that's a big contribution, the unconscious, this idea that whatever's going on consciously, whatever you're aware of uh, in the moment, there's stuff going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of, but that is definitely influencing your behavior and your feelings and your reactions to other people. So uh, uh, just understanding that in and of itself uh, is a great contribution from Freud. With Jung and Erickson, really, we focus more on their specific contribution. Uh, Jungian psychology, for me, the greatest contribution is this, the, um, the study of archetypes. This idea that not only is, this, is there this unconscious realm of existence that we all live in, but it, we're all connected <laughs> unconsciously. All of the stories, all of the movies, all the TV shows and books that we've written have these symbolic figures in them. And at a certain level of uh, abstraction, all of those figures are the same. Uh, we share a common sim symbology or a common way of making symbols uh, that are relevant for everyone. Uh, so Jung, uh, Jung's theory of archetypes to me is really a, a, a vital uh, toolbox for writers who are trying to figure out how to uh, how to present their characters on the screen for their audience. And it doesn't mean that every character has to be an archetype, but if you understand your archetypes and you understand how they function, then you can understand, well, who is this character? What is this character's conflict? And how is this character going to be presented on the screen? Um, so, so that's you know, basically this sort of collection of symbols that can be um, projected onto any type of character. With Erickson, it's more about identity, uh, the sort of personal struggle uh, to define one's identity. Um, and Erickson's um, uh, stage theory starts with birth and ends basically with death. So he gives us eight chapters in life that any person who's developing is going to go through. So that's some wonderful structure as well. If you want to tell the, the life story mm -hmm. of somebody, or even if you want to tell a story about someone in a discrete, discrete period of time, you could think of it in an Ericksonian sense. Well, if character is another word for identity, and if every story is about character development, then every story is also about identity development. So if I have a character who has a conflict, I could think of that as an identity crisis, one of Erickson's eight identity crises. And a good question for me is, well, you know, what character, uh, what identity crisis is this character going through? And another thing to remember is that every character is always going through some type of identity crisis. That's sort of the heart of Erickson's theory, that we're all developing constantly. We're all going through an identity crisis. Uh, so if you understand the eight different identity crises, then those are great tools to project onto your characters as well. It gives you sort of instant conflict or at least instant understanding of what a conflict could be for that character. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. Um, so then I also noticed um, two of your chapters were on the hero's journey. The One was on the hero's journey. One was the heroine's journey. Um, yeah. So again, I think as screenwriters, probably most of us have heard of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Um, right. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Um, what is your spin on that from sort of a psychological standpoint? Well, basically what Joseph Campbell did, and he's not wasn't the first one to do this, but he kind of, I guess, did it the most successfully, was he looked at what he called the monomyth, meaning uh, uh, taking all of the myths and ancient stories and folk tales and fairy tales that have become part of our, what Jung would call our collective unconscious and breaking it down to a common, common pattern that you can see in the life story of Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and every prophet and every you know classical hero and every demigod from the uh, Judeo-Christian um, uh, mythos. All of these uh, all of these characters have a monomyth because they seem to go through similar patterns of uh, events in their life and also similar conflicts with their father, with their mother, with their um, significant others. Um, so the idea is well. 
why do we have a thousand stories, but they all have the same basic pattern? And also, why do we have a thousand hero characters, but it's all basically the same character? And Joseph Campbell was not a psychologist, but his work is very psychological. And what he did was from his understanding of Freud and Jung and Otto Rank and some others, he was able to say, the reason we have this monomyth, the reason why the pattern keeps repeating itself is because it has a psychological function. Everybody is going on an adventure in their life. Everybody is seeking their identity. Everybody has to come to grips with issues such as, you know, what did I get from my mother? What did I get from my father? Everybody has to figure out how they're going to accomplish what they dream of accomplishing while also being a good person, a good citizen, a good father, husband, wife, son, etc. So these are all the struggles that we de deal with in daily life. And the hero's journey is merely a reflection of that taking somebody's average life and their average struggles and their average conflicts and conflating it into a huge mythological story with gods and demons and great battles and uh, uh, monsters and things like that. It's making it uh, a big dramatic scene so that people will want to listen to it. But the reason people want to listen to it is not because it's dramatic or because it's big or because it has gods and devils. The reason we're interested in it is because it's telling the story of ourselves. And we see ourselves in the hero and we see ourselves in every stage of the hero's journey because they're all just different symbols of life and the struggles in life. Mm -hmm. So what is the heroine's journey? Um, how does that differ and how does that compare? The heroine's journey is, well, well first of all, we have to say that the, <laughs> the hero's journey, um, this sort of classic 17 stage structure that Campbell delineated is an ancient structure and it harkens back to a time uh, where men had all of the power in society and women had none. Uh, so the women characters in the mythological hero's journey are ancillary characters. They're not the hero. Uh, and that's not how we live today. In, in today's world, men and women are equal and they each have their own adventures. And a woman can be a hero just like a man. And we don't even use the term heroine anymore. Even that term is a retrograde term. We say, well, there's a female hero or a male hero hero or a non-binary hero. So um, the, per the reason we have the, uh, uh, Maureen Murdoch wrote the book, The Heroine's Journey, is to point out that A, the hero's journey is uh, retrograde, that it, it shows a very sort of old version of what a man should be, and certainly a very old version of what a woman should be. So if you're writing a female hero character, you can't rely on the regular hero's journey, because that's the story of a man, and a man is different from a woman, and it's, it's also a story about a very ancient man <laughs> in very ancient times. So you have to update the story or update the mythological pattern, not just so that it's modern, but also so that it's inclusive of the challenges of a woman. And what so what Maureen Murdoch was uh, putting forth was the idea that there are certain challenges that women in our society face that men don't have to face. So for example, uh, in a story like uh, say Erin Brockovich, which is a typical story of a woman hero, her first challenge is not to sort of find her nemesis and challenge that person. That comes a little bit later, later on. Her first challenge is to sort of state to the people around her, hey, I can be a hero too. Just because a woman, I'm a woman doesn't mean I can't be a hero. So for Erin Brockovich, her first challenge isn't, you know, this great legal battle. Her first challenge is to get people to take her seriously as someone in the field of law because she's a woman and also because she's not a lawyer. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so it's uh, uh, we needed that uh, structure for modern female heroes who are not going to be derivative of the traditional male hero character and who are also not going to be derivative of the traditional female character as we've known her so far. So how do you create a new female hero for the 21st century? Well, you need to rework the ancient patterns so that they work for the modern day. Mm -hmm. And don't you think a lot of what you're getting, you're sort of touching a lot of what you're describing, sort of this old Joseph Campbell version of a hero versus the more, you know, the, the more modern version. A lot of it is 
a lot of what the arguments today we're having in this country, um, you know, from top to bottom politically and everything else. And I do wonder, like, I mean, obviously you're a college professor for you're coming from that angle, but I, I do wonder if, if, like you say, well, things have to be updated, but we see movies like the, the most recent Tom Cruise Maverick do extremely well. And I would argue that that's definitely, you know, harkens back to a more traditional view of the hero um, as opposed to maybe more, a more modern view. Um, and these things can still work. I mean, if, if they're baked into our psychology, don't you think that's going to be a tough thing to change? Well, first of, first of all, um, the reason Joseph Campbell's model is so popular is because it still works. Um, so it works if, if you're writing a hero who is a retrograde hero, who's a sort of ca uh, uh, callback to, you know, Perseus or Hercules or these ancient classical heroes, then that structure is perfectly appropriate for you. And the majority of heroes that we see on the screen are these sort of non-realistic ancient superhero types. You know, the superheroes themselves are not modern characters. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, for ancient sure. Classical uh, demi demigod heroes, half divine heroes. So most of the heroes we see on the screen are not modern. However, when thinking about the female character and writing the female as a hero uh, in a way that's not derivative of either the male pattern or of the traditional female pattern, then I think is where, is where the new structure comes in. But you don't need a new structure for an ancient hero. And if most of the heroes we're seeing on the screen are ancient heroes in terms of their structure anyway, mm -hmm. then that's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so again, you had a couple of chapters sort of on genre. Um, and I'd be curious, just same sort of thing. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, the Western fantasy sci-fi. Those are three genres you pulled out. Um, how do you apply some of this psychology to those specific genres? Um, you know, all genres we're, we're well familiar with at this point. Well, for, for the Western um, and I actually, and I wrote, actually I wrote a book about each of those genres and the psychology of each of those genres. Um, for the for the Western, again, we have a, a, a the, the Western hero is typically a very masculine hero who harkens back to the sort of classical heroes of old. Uh, so a lot of the discussion in that chapter is, well, how do we take this very, very kind of retrograde character and modernize it a bit for the screen? But I also spend a lot of time try, trying to get to the heart of what the Western is. Uh, and the Western is very personal genre for Americans because it's our mythology. It's not, you know, Gladiator or Braveheart or Superman or Spider-Man. This is the mythology of the American West, the time when our mythos and our heroes and our um, kind of archetypal symbols were all born. Um, so it tells the story of us to us in a way that's supposed to make us reflect upon ourselves. Um, and that's why the Western is such a popular genre, especially in America. And that's why it's, it doesn't, everyone keeps saying, oh, the Western's going to die, the Western's going to die, but it never dies. And, and again, the reason is because it's that one mythology that is truly our mythology as Americans. And whenever you wanna to get to some type of touchstone of the American culture or the American ethos, we always just sort of by default go back to the Western. So it's the genre that's truly us and the genre that we Americans use to define us. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's such an inherently violent genre uh, is merely a reflection of American culture. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Could you break down sci-fi? I'd love to hear your thoughts on sci-fi. That's a genre I've written a little bit in. Yeah, well, I really start. I start with fantasy and try to understand fantasy as really the ch uh, the psychology of childhood. Uh, what the what the child fears, what the child wants the most, and uh, how the child deals with conflicts in ways that are different from the ways that adults deal with conflict. Uh, so I use Pan's Labyrinth as kind of an uh, excellent example of a story that you're really seeing through the eyes of a child. Um, Sci-fi is fantasy. The only difference between sci science fiction and fantasy is uh, the sort of plot device that gets the story going. In fantasy, there's some type of magic at play. 
Um, whether it's a magic ring or a magic mirror or a magic wand or a magic sword, there's some type of magic at play. And the plot revolves around that, ma that magic and the character develops, you know, along with that magic. Um, in science fiction, it's not magic, but science. There's some type of scientific thing, or some type of a, a new weapon or a new computer or a new type of uh, psychological power that someone has discovered, right? So it's, uh, so science science fiction is fantasy but the magic is science and mm -hmm. that's really the only difference um once you you see that difference all the other differences become sort of un, unimportant so for instance uh fantasy is usually set either in the past or in some sort of mythological realm that feels like the past whereas science fiction is typically set in the future or in some sort of dystopian society that seems somewhat futuristic of uh, the future is associated with science the past with magic hmm. that's fascinating yeah i've never thought of it quite like that now you mentioned something that was interesting like fantasy when you started out you were saying that it had to do with the child and you were seeing pan's labyrinth the whole thing was through the child do you think that that's a piece of it where sci-fi is more it's the same convention where there's this piece of magic but sci-fi maybe leans a little more towards adult fantasy leans more towards children and i'm just spitballing ideas i don't know it just is fascinating the way you said that it made me think of that well i think tr traditionally fantasy literature was written for children like the lord of the rings was considered a children's yeah. book and science fiction traditionally were for adults or for young adults those divisions have broken down long ago so that you know we adults can enjoy the lord mm -hmm. of the rings and um, all, all those fantasy films just as much as we enjoy science fiction and children enjoy science fiction so i think the uh uh the sort of divisions uh by by genre you know science fiction for older people, fantasy for young. I don't think those exist anymore. In the huh. same way that animation used to be for children, but now everybody, you know, I love watching, you know, uh, uh, adult animated stuff. Yeah. Uh, so those, those things, um, with, with the broadening of all genres and with the sort of the, the condensation of all genres into the digital medium, uh, we don't see that much division anymore. Mm -hmm. Everybody watches everything. It's, it's kind of how I feel. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Um, in fact, I saw an interesting statistic. It's like 25% of the toy market in this day and age is actually selling toys to adults. There's like yeah. adults that collect these things. So you're right. A lot of those lines have been blurred. So this is just a couple of final questions before we wrap up. I was just curious. I was looking at all your books. I know there's a lot of screenwriters that also are, you know, book authors, whether it be fiction or nonfiction. Maybe you can just give us a little primer. How did you go about writing these books and ultimately getting them published? Um, you have any tips for for writers on that front oh I, my, I, in terms of publishing i took the traditional path is you know i had an idea i wrote a proposal and i sent them out to publishers um my, my tip to anybody who wants to go into book writing is to get a book contract before you write the actual book uh, a so you don't waste your own time and also be because publishers uh especially nowadays are becoming increasingly particular about what they want to publish um so uh you're probably going to have to work with your publisher uh in writing the book it's generally not a good idea to write a book and then see who wants to publish it yeah yeah that's it's the same thing with screen screenwriters don't want to hear it but a lot of the time it's the same thing with screenwriters you're much better off getting that producer involved as early as possible yeah. um, I, I wrote a couple of scripts on spec back in the day and they're still you know sitting in my you know <laughs> desk mm -hmm. drawer uh especially nowadays you, you uh you can't you can't just assume that somebody wants to hear your story uh you have to get out there and do a lot of legwork just to find someone to listen to you pitch your story mm -hmm. and then hopefully you can write it yeah yeah for sure i think that's great advice um so just to wrap up the interview is there anything you've seen recently that you can recommend to screenwriters especially sort of under this lens of psychology um some some programs on hbo netflix hulu anything you would recommend that screenwriters check out well um the thing that just pops up in my mind uh is um the mandalorian which is a series on disney plus mm -hmm. it's a star wars series uh are you familiar with it yeah, yeah, actually I've seen most of it, yeah. Yeah, it's uh 
And I really enjoyed watching that because as I was watching it, I saw how clearly that it was a Western. And also having been a student of the Westerns my whole life, I saw that um, what Jean Favreau was doing was he was taking each episode and using it as a sort of homage to a classic Western film. So mm -hmm. there's some great John Ford films that are represented in the, in the Mandalorian, the sort of the classic Magnificent Seven type story where uh, the heroes get the townspeople together to fight the enemies. Um, there's a sort of classic Jesse James character that we see in some, uh, uh, the whole structure mm -hmm. of the series itself is based on the story, The Three Godfathers, which is a classic, classic Western theme of three outlaws who uh, uh, find a, a woman and her baby, you know, in, in the wilderness, and the mother dies, but the three outlaws become sort of uh, surrogate parents to this baby, and they sacrifice themselves to save it. Um, that that film has been made several times. Um, so yeah, so The Mandalorian is interesting because if you're interested in westerns and you're interested not only in uh, classic westerns, but how you can take the classic western and make a modern science fiction uh, movie or television mm -hmm. show about it. Uh, I thought The Mandalorian is wonderful. They did a great job, and it never felt derivative. It never felt like, oh, I've seen this a thousand times before, even though you literally have seen the characters and mm -hmm. the story and the plot a thousand times before. But because it's in outer space, and because there's Baby Yoda and all these aliens and all these different devices, it makes it seem brand new when it's a really, really, really old story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so watch The Mandalorian if you're interested in Westerns, if you're interested specifically in doing up Dated westerns, and also if you're if you're interested in you know how to take a, a very old character like we were talking about before from the hero's journey, and turning that character into sort of a modern sci-fi superhero type character. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. And I just want to let you pitch your books. Um, where can you find psychology for screenwriters um, and and your other books as well? Um, I assume anywhere where um, books are sold, but maybe you can give a quick plug there. Tell us where we sure. can potentially find your books. Well, the second edition of Psychology for Screenwriters, which includes those three new chapters that we were talking about on fantasy, science fiction, and the Western, uh, that's, go that's coming out in January 2023. So that'll okay. be out next month, and you can get that on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com, anywhere where books are sold, Barnes & Noble stores, or mwp.com, that's the publisher. Uh, my other books on film and my other books about media psychology are all available in the same places okay. uh, on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or anywhere books are sold. Perfect. Perfect. And what's the best way for people to just keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll put in the show notes. Um, if you go on YouTube and you type in psychology for screenwriters, you will find a new page that I invented called the psychology for screenwriters channel, Okay, uh, where I... Um, uh, just do very brief videos, maybe not so brief, uh, in which I talk about a specific psychological theme, and then I use a specific film or uh, a couple of films uh, using frame captures to sort of uh, sh show visually how these filmmakers are using psychology in their films. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, William, I really appreciate you coming on talking with me today. Good luck with this book, and hopefully I'll have you back on and talk about your next book. A lot of fun. Thanks a lot. So, Take care. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it.
We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly Best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is a monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. And that's our show. Thank you for listening.